Good to see you. Dr. William, Dr. Samantha is a secretary of the Indian Arthroscopy Society, a very dynamic uh, office bearer, and he's uh, standing for actually the presidential post of uh, the Indian uh, Orthopedic Association. Sir, we are live now. It's, yeah, uh, perfect. Thank, thank you, you, Sandeep. Uh, no. uh, friends, welcome. Uh, good evening uh, to this webinar of Indian Arthroscopy Society. It's a webinar which is totally different from all the uh, programs which we had held previously. And in this webinar, we're going to talk about core muscle injuries. And uh, we have a master here who is going to discuss this. Uh, the team is uh, comprising of Dr. William Myers. Uh, Dr. Myers is from Duke University, Jefferson Medical College, Philadelphia. And along with him will be Dr. Alexander Poor. Dr. Dinshaw Padiwala has put up this show and uh, I must thank him on behalf of Indian Arthroscopy Society. Dinshaw would kindly introduce our guest speakers today uh, to all of our members and then we follow it by that is the presentation. Thank you, IPS. Uh, it's really a proud moment for us in the Indian Arthroscopy Society to have uh, uh, Dr. Bill Myers here with us today. Dr. William Myers has dedicated more than 30 years pioneering the diagnosis, treatment, rehabilitation, and prevention of core muscle injuries. And uh, core muscle injuries is a new term. We've been calling it uh, an uh, athletic pubalgia. We've been calling it sports hernia and all sorts of names since many, many years. And I think this introduction for Bill uh, is, is really worthwhile to see. The Vincera Foundation is devoted to kids' development, both physically and mentally. Grew up in Andover, Massachusetts. It's uh, just north of Boston. Sports was at the center of entertainment, I guess. And my sister was probably, the, she was three years older, probably the best athlete in town. She was, she was unbelievable in terms of uh, an athlete. But she didn't have the opportunities, you know, and so, you know, I was the guy that played baseball, but she would come out to the practices and would hit all the home runs and stuff. Initially, I uh, was in the public school system in, Ander in Andover, and then with time I ended up in the church school, which is in uh, Wallingford, Connecticut. I just wanted to develop from, a, from an independent thought standpoint. I had a great time there and uh, you know, participated in a lot of activities and then ended up, ended up at Harvard. I was in the class of 1971, and you know it was it was fun times, but it was it was a little bit turbulent time nationally, certainly. But these are Woodstock times, and a bunch of my friends went down to Woodstock. Um, I actually traveled down there with a group, but we couldn't get near the place. I don't know how the people got into this. It was it was so crowded, so we turned around and did something else. I can't remember what we did. Uh, didn't go in there with the intention of going into medicine. I decided to become a doctor probably my sophomore year in college. My specialty I call core medicine, and it's really the study and treatment of the region of the body from mid-thigh to mid-chest. There is no specialty called core medicine. Certainly there are people who are studying the shoulder and the knees. A lot of people doing that. But, and this is a complex region. The field really focuses upon integrating the organs and the muscles and the bones in this region of the body. And this is where your power comes from. Everything works together. Following certain principles, you can train athletes in various ways to prevent an injury. A good core takes the stresses off the extremities. I quit my job in the deanship and chairmanship of an academic uh, uh, department and decided to start an institute just devoted to the study of this region. The Vincere Institute is all about diagnosing and treating and preventing the injury and making people be able to perform at their best ability. Kids can participate in their regular sports activities and also be studied as they do it to help them to perform better and to prevent injury. A patient can come and probably should be prepared to spend the day. We put them through 
imaging and diagnostic injections, other things, and can usually come up with the correct diagnosis, even though it may have been a stumping diagnosis for years, and can even deliver the appropriate treatment, making people be able to perform at their best ability. There's nothing more important for an athlete. And with Dr. William Myers, we've got Dr. Alexander Poor with us too. Alexander's done a seven-year residency at the Drexel University uh, College of Medicine. He then joined the Vincera Institute as a fellow in core medicine, uh, which he completed in 2016. And he's now a partner at the Vincera Institute. So a big welcome to you both, Bill and Alexander. Thank you for accepting this invitation. Core medicine is a largely unknown sort of branch in, in medicine. It really doesn't fall totally into orthopedics. It doesn't fall into abdominal surgery. And uh, it, it would be, but it's still so common. These injuries are still so common. We've got uh, the Indian Premier League cricket going on and some of our star guys are not playing primarily because of core muscle injuries. So it, it's certainly being recognized uh, more commonly today. Uh, Bill, before we start off with today's program, what made you choose core medicine? Because I know you're not an orthopedic surgeon. You are a GI guy. You've done some great liver surgery work. So what made you go, go into core medicine? Totally by chance. It, uh, I, I had actually the largest, uh, I believe, the largest liver surgery practice in the country for many years. And, uh, and I think it was because I was on the tall side that people thought that I was an orthopedic surgeon. And I was asked to help cover the Duke teams. And, uh, and I was actually already helping to cover the United States soccer team. And, um, and because of what I was doing, because people realized I wasn't an orthopedic surgeon, I was involved with the innards, uh, I started getting referred uh, many patients, mostly athletes uh, with mysterious pain in the pelvis. And this goes back to the mid 1980s. And, uh, and that what we were just starting a fresh cadaver lab at the time, and uh, and seeking to become more familiar with the anatomy, uh, we used that and figured out uh, what the functional anatomy was, and and uh, and then purely by uh, uh, intestinal fortitude, uh, we did our first few cases uh, based upon where the lo the the locations of the pain were the, in the in several patients. And it seemed to be fleeting. It would go from the abdomen to the groin to the other groin and the other abdomen. And, um, and so we, uh, in the lab, worked out where the, what the anatomy was there. And sure enough, as we uh, explored the first three patients, uh, we saw real pathology and uh, were able to repair it. And then by word of mouth, it was really through, from player to player in the field that we started getting a lot, a lot more patients. And uh, that's, that's sort of the... Uh, the chance of it all. And uh, as I trained more people in liver surgery, uh, this became uh, more and more of a hobby. And, uh, and it remains, remains a hobby. It's a, it's a lifelong hobby, uh, but it, uh, and there's, there's just more and more things that we're learning. And this is all you do? Uh, well, you know, I, I sleep and, uh, <laughs> and, and sometimes eat. And um, and do uh, you know? I, I enjoy sports, but you know I'm in the phase now where uh, you know I need a new hip, and I need a new knee, or something like that. And um, and you know I get, go to go to games. I enjoy that, and uh, uh, I have a little bit of an outside life. But um, we, I, I switched from being dean of a medical school. We took a, a bankrupt health system, the largest one in Philadelphia, and made it into a single medical school and into uh, several hospitals. And but switched from that position to uh, open an institute because I was determined with several of the well-known hip arthroscopists in the country to have a place where we could uh, both attack the hip and the muscles at the same time. So that's we opened the institute in 2013. Great. Okay, Bill, I think we're all ready for the webinar, and I'll uh, request you to start off uh, with the surgical and the functional anatomy of the core? Well, it's, it's my privilege. And uh, if we could get onto the slides, um, 
uh, presentation, that'd be great. Um, it is uh, our job uh, today, and I've got uh, Alex Poor right behind me. I think that uh, you probably can see him. And uh, Alex was my uh, resident in, in, in the, um, at, at Drexel University and uh, then became a fellow for two years here. And uh, is, as mentioned, is, is now my uh, junior partner or, or senior, he's getting more and more senior every day. And, um, and we've got uh, several others. We'll, we'll have another fellow uh, or, 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 or our present fellow join us uh, probably for a moment. We have a radiologist who is um, uh, who will probably join us in, in a little bit. Uh, we'll have a patient, most likely, uh, one of the NFL players on whom we just did surgery, uh, join us. And um, our job uh, today is to totally convince you that uh, the core uh, core medicine should be a, a real specialty. It's a it's, it's it, of course it's a complex area in theory, but I, we, our job is to make it simple for you to understand uh, in general. And um, how do I start to get to the next slide here? Um, the, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about has just uh, come out in a book. Uh, we wrote it, uh, uh, Mark Philippon and my radiologist Adam Zoga and Alex and Johannes, who you probably meet, and several others are um, co-editors of it. And, um, and it's, it's uh, uh, getting a, a fair amount of sales. And it's, it uh, really goes into this in depth and, and goes through, uh, most importantly, what, um, uh, what is, uh, how we define the core, but, but also why we haven't recognized this. And there's been certain obstacles uh, just uh, related to uh, complexity or seeming complexity there's uh, related to the sexual organs being there. Uh, if you uh, uh, if if you Google the core, you almost always get from the waist up, and um, you don't get the the going from the mid chest or mid thigh. And really, it's this whole region that is the core. And um, and the the principal focus is what connects the top part of the body to the bottom part of the body. And you'll see that sort of, that sort of led us into the, the um, idea that this is really the biggest joint in the body, uh, the, the pubic bone being the center of this all. And it's large, it was largely undiscovered where I think we've made a lot of uh, our progress. And so, as I mentioned, our job is to totally convince you that this is not only a joint, but a region of the body that needs um, specialists. specialists. <clears throat> and I just want to start off with a very commonly used uh, radiology uh, uh, sketch, <clears throat> which, and you may have seen this before. If you've not seen it before, there really are two women in here. One is a young woman. The, the, this is her chin, this is her eyelash. And She's looking off behind her a little bit. This is a beautiful neck. Uh, this is her hair. And the um, other woman is an older, uh, not so attractive woman. Uh, this would be her mouth. This would be her chin. And usually when you look at this the first time, you see one of them. And, you, and it's hard to see the other one. And the other one's right there. As soon as you see it, you got it. And, um, and that's what we want you to do. We want you to put on new eyes. We want you to see what we're seeing. And this is the more understandable one, perhaps. Uh, the emblem for the 2014 FIFA World Cup in Brazil. Uh, and then, you know, it was, it, was, it was a very optimistic type of a uh, emblem. And then Brazil lost to Germany, uh, got killed by Germany. And this is what came out in the, uh, the Rio de Janeiro press the next day, uh, a depressing uh, type of a, um, uh, a different way to look at the emblem. And um, so I'd like to actually turn just to uh, Alex while we're, while we're here and uh, just ask Alex, uh, when did, or maybe he didn't see the light, when did he put on new eyes in terms of all this? Yeah, so um, 
as you said, I was your resident for a good number of years and um, you started the Institute and I was lucky enough to come down and join you for a two-year fellowship. And so when I arrived at the Vincera as a fellow, I really thought I was in a great position because I had spent years rotating my Dr. Meyer service and assisted and helped him perform numerous cases. Um, and then he started really teaching me and I realized I didn't, I didn't understand it at all. And it really took a long time of just kind of the, the old fashioned apprenticeship really him guiding me through. And the biggest thing he kept encouraging me was just to look at it, just look at the anatomy. And I thought, geez, I've been looking at the anatomy for years. What are you talking about? And it really clicked after, you know, sometime in, in my second year where all of a sudden you really, you have to embrace the fact that this is one structure. And it's incredibly complex. And if you try to hone in on what the colorectal surgeons taught you about the area or the urologists talk about the area or hernia specialists teach you about the area or orthopedic surgeons who are looking at the hip joint, you end up with multiple disjointed pathways. And the, the whole essence here, when it clicked for me, was when I, I realized it's all one entity and you really need to approach each case with that frame of mind. And yeah, it took a long time for me. I, I'm probably not the best as adapter, but I got through. Yeah, we've got you got James. Uh, come over into the picture here, James, uh, our, our newest. Uh, fellow, he's been here uh, probably just about a month, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask him. Wait, wave there, James, if you could, just good. Um, and uh, I'm not going to ask him the same question because I'm not sure he's got the new eyes yet. But I think he's uh, probably uh, beginning to get the new eyes. We've got him over working in radiology. Do you have any new eyes yet in terms of uh, looking at this? Yeah. Um, he's saying the right things. <laughs> and, um, so, so uh, he's working in our, with our radiologist now in terms of learning uh, the techniques in terms of the percutaneous uh, uh, injections and aspirations, et cetera. Now, I'm going to blast through some slides. And, uh, and the whole purpose is, again, to familiar, familiar, familiarize everybody with anatomy and to convince you. That's, that's my total purpose. And if I haven't convinced you by the end of the lecture, then I've totally failed. And I'll go out and do something else. Um, the, 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 these, of course, are, are players and, and, and uh, uh, pretty good soccer players, and, um, and they, uh, they have an engine within them. And, and think of this as the, what makes them uh, 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 excellent. Uh, being close to the ground, uh, like Messi is uh, relatively from the standpoint of height, probably helps in terms of soccer, uh, but uh, everything is generated uh, by what we're we call the core. Um, we had uh, Marshawn Lynch, who's one of our famous uh, football players, spent a few weeks with us after his surgery, and uh, and and he he got it. He's, this is his way to express that he was able to put on new eyes, and uh, that was kind of fun. So we put that into the into the book. Now, when you think about the core, think of it as a an organ. Think of it as uh, just one way to look at it. Uh, think of it as um, uh, having certain advantages or disadvantages in terms of sports. And you're born with certain things and you're born without certain things. And um, this is Tyson Gay, one of, certainly one of the best uh, track uh, stars, sprinters. And I mean, look at his glutes, you know, they're, they're huge. And that is important for a world-class sprinter. The shapes of your hips are really important in general. Uh, the ability, the, the how much your adductors will allow your hips to 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 uh, uh, spread eagle, et cetera, uh, is really important for an ice hockey goalie. And so the you know, in addition to um, other organs, the core seems to be a principal organ. And basically, we, we play with three organs or right, good athletes. One is your core and what you got there. The second is your brain, and that's really how you use your core. You know, you don't, you're not stupid and try to over, over uh, uh, do something if you have restricted motions of your hip. Uh, you're the Beckenbauer uh, in, in soccer who is able to just you look perfectly smooth, effortless. Uh, this is Dominic Hasek. This is Sidney, Sidney Crosby, our best North American ice hockey player now. Just let me look at the size of his thighs. These were not just uh, 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 there to be developed. These were, uh, this, this is what, what he was born with to a large degree. And of course, the person probably with the, with the greatest core, most well-known core, LeBron. Um, I mean, he had a setback related to this and he's uh, obviously uh, done really quite well. Now, this is someone who is uh, not so smart in terms of uh, the connection between the core and the brain. Uh, this is a, uh, someone who became a well-known acrobat uh, who was 
at, at, at the age of 13, he ran away with a circus. And he was so enthralled by being by people doing splits, et cetera. Uh, but he had real impingement anatomy of his hips. And um, look at his hips at the age of 26. Uh, it's, uh, there, I, I think most people in the Indian Arthroscopy Society would agree that uh, they don't look very good. And he ended up having total hips. But he was a great acrobat, a great uh, well-known cir circus performer uh, for several years before um, uh, the um, he had his uh, retirement. The, 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 and that brings in the third organ, which is the heart. Uh, the heart can work for you or against you. If it makes you bring you championships, but it can certainly shorten your career. Um, now, this is my eureka moment. This is the mid, uh, I think it was like 1986. Um, I was uh, a liver surgeon covering um, the, I, I forget which sport, football or soccer. And, um, and we were, I just seen three players uh, in the field house and I had a sub intern uh, lady who was uh, working with me and we went over to the fresh cadaver lab and what was unique about the players or common about the players was that they had fleeting pain going from the abdomen, the adductor to the other side, as I mentioned earlier. And, um, and I had her put her finger, we, I wanted to de demonstrate if we did something up in the abdomen, would you be able to recognize it down in the adductors or, or below the waist? And it only looks like a couple of inches here, but it's probably a good eight or 10 inches. And she put her finger behind the three adductors and on top of the anterior edge of the inferior pubic ramus, and which has some teeth to it. And when I cut about 25% or so of the rectus abdominis muscle, the pelvis flopped forward and it pinched her finger and she uh, let, out, let out a scream as depicted by the, the tear here. And, um, and she, uh, while, while we were all excited, hey, you know, something was going on down below, uh, she, was, uh, she was hurting and her finger did get better. Uh, and, and we did go on and do uh, further um, experiments. And we did things like this. We did the same experiment cut the rectus abdominis muscle a little bit and put had a, some pressure gauges inside the hip joint. So a tremendous raises in pre pressure um, when we uh, did, did various things uh, to the muscles. Uh, and we, so we recognized there was some connection there. We didn't know what it was um, or we didn't know all the complexities of it, but uh, we have still been working on this and, and do understand a fair amount of it. Another set of experiments that was kind of key to under, understanding was to determine the range of motion of the hip, which was not just determined by the ball and the socket. You could cut, uh, for example, the uh, portions of the adductor muscles and you would get increased range of motion. Often it was the femoral um, uh, vein artery nerve complex, which determined the range of motion. And it varied from individual to individual and, and it did vary in terms of the shape of the hip. And we did some additional experiments showing that we could affect the other side the other hip by doing some of these things and the the forces would get transmitted to the other side really uh indicating to us that gee if you have a problem on one side you better be thinking about the other side at some point too and uh and we better be thinking about this entire unit this mid thigh to mid chest unit as a uh, unit which has two sides to it and uh, not ignore the other side um, now this is the, the, the core is the strike zone for the, in baseball. This would probably would be what uh, uh, how Boomer uh, gets his uh, fast bowling uh, ability. Um, I imagine that, uh, what's it, Virat uh, Kohli, uh, I guess he, he's learned to use this to generate power when he hits the, the, uh, uh, the ball or what do you call it? The cricket ball. The cricket ball. Cricket ball. Um, the, um, and you got to pay homage to Vitruvius and to uh, Da Vinci. Uh, they knew it. They, they knew that this was, this core was important. They, the, uh, they call the center of the, um, of the, 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 the body uh, just above the pubic bone. And um, uh, Barishnikov has uh, followed suit. And it's really this complex, the rectus abdominis muscles, the adductors, which conduct a lot of the symphony of the core, and we'll go into that um, um, pretty quickly. Uh, now, it seemed complex, but now we're going to simplify it. And think of the core as four units. One is the back. Think of the ribs as being connected to the to the back. 
Uh, the second, think of the hip joint with the, with the femur, the rest of the femur there. The third, think of all the muscles and the rest of the pelvic bones as uh, a third part of it. And fourth, think of everything else, throat, the intestines, the bladder, nerves, vessels, et cetera, into that um, other section. Because uh, in here, when people have groin or pelvic symptoms are some traps in terms of the real important thing or more important things rather than sports uh, in terms of tumors and, and other things that can occur there. Think also in terms of the, <clears throat> the man and the woman having a, a significantly different anatomy. It may seem subtle, but the, for the same reason, you get knee problems in women more commonly than in men, perhaps. Um, you get differences in the quantities of injuries in different parts of the core. Uh, think of the back. Now, the back is complex, and we and I sort of put this into one category and then forget about it the most part because it's so complex. But I think of it as a slinky, the old-fashioned slinky, and uh, with the ribs and the uh, skeleton, uh, the vertebrae uh, as a unit. And then I put it out of my mind for the most part and put it in the category of other when we start thinking about diagnoses that occur. Um, I mentioned that the rectus abdominis and the adductors and the pubic bone form a complex. Think of this as your harness or your bridle. This is what you're able to control. This is what speaks to the brain. And think of all the other muscles on the outside as the power muscles. Uh, the bull rider or the, the, uh, um, the bronco rider really exhibits that in terms of the harness. Perhaps it's uh, that those muscle muscles are more like a bridle. But think of that as the directors of your um, of, 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 the, of the core, of the body. Um, and also think of the bridle and the harness as having a connection to the brain. The brain tells you something, you shift, you do your motions, and, uh, and then you get directives to the other parts of the core. And we'll show you just uh, some summaries of one particular slide of a summary of experiments, how the brain connects to the core. Uh, Baryshnikov's uh, pupil, one of her, his pupils, demonstrated this so nicely that the center of all the core is, the, uh, is right in here. And, um, and, and the beauty of it is actually what, uh, to some degree, uh, uh, keeps us from studying it. Um, because it, uh, you get into taboos, et cetera, orthopedic surgeons to do complete examinations may be uh, something that uh, is, is, uh, brings up some degree of reluctance. Um, but think of the core as, uh, as uh, controlling the extremities. This uh, well-known uh, MVP basketball player in the NBA had a groin injury that was not repaired, and he ended up with an anterior cruciate knee injury and could never really quite recover from that. And you, you wonder, gee, if you fix the core, would that have uh, uh, turned out to be better? Um, this is sort of a summary of a bunch of experiments. In terms of reaction time, in terms of balance, in terms of vision, and Alex had a lot to do with these, uh, uh, the, um, uh, these studies, uh, visual, visual fields. Uh, if you have a core injury, we could really demonstrate diminution, uh, some real loss of those things and um, cognitive abilities. And then when you corrected the injury, uh, it all came back. And, and this all also brings up whether we should be using some of these with such things as return to play, et cetera. Uh, the, the, the confidence certainly is related to the reaction time and balance and visual fields as much as it, is, as it is to feeling better in general. Now, my favorite analogy is the baseball. Uh, and uh, th this is how that works. Think of the pubic bone as, as the center of the universe, the body's universe here, and think of it as a regular sized baseball. And so it's the attachments are of the uh, muscles from above, the rectus abdominis muscle, the adductors, baby doctor muscles, are to the cover of the baseball. And we'll get that into, into that more. Um, there, here's the rectus abdominis muscles, here's the adductors, the pectineus, the adductor longus, and, and the brevis are the most important ones. In some people, you have a fairly well-developed pyramidalis muscle. This has relatively little function, uh, except in conjunction with the rectus abdominis muscle. Uh, so you think of the baseball being in this region right here. Uh, and you can peel off that, that cover of the baseball uh, with sharp or blunt dissection. And it really is fiber cartilage. It's not uh, just dense fibrous tissue. It's fi it, the aponeuroses, the aponeurotic plate that radiologists uh, talk about, our radiologists talk about, um, 
really is in the superficial aspects of this. Most of this is fiber cartilage. And, um, and that actually is really helpful in terms of repair. As we get into repair, really the anatomy is what determines how you do it, what the problem is, and, um, and the long-term results. Uh, and you can just do more and more dissections, get deeper and deeper, and you can see the different uh, parts of the anatomy, the psoas muscle behind there, which masquerade as a bunch of other types of problems. Uh, but to know the vectors, know the forces, comes into great importance in terms of how to fix these things. And when you have an injury of one muscle, you're gonna get compensatory uh, problems on the other muscles often, and you have to do some type of compartmental decompression often to get the person all the way better. Uh, if we have time, I think we will, I'm gonna show a couple of short videos of the treatment, uh, but let's get into more of the injuries. Uh, this is Nomar Garcia Parr from a few years ago, who uh, happens to be uh, uh, Mia Hamm's uh, husband. Um, and uh, again, the baseball analogy, this shows two things. Uh, I had the artist put baseball where your pubic bone is. This, the two things it's showing is the fact that the, there's a common assertion, the cover, the fiber cartilage. And the second is when you get some type of an injury, you get a compensatory tug of war on the cover, and then you get this looseness of the cover. And it, affects, it often affects both sides. Um, this led us to developing the radiology for this. This is normal baseball cover and, uh, and um, pubic bone and fiber cartilage. The fiber cartilage is dark. And then when you get a looseness, you get this fluid that may be generated from the, uh, the normal fluid between the two uh, halves of the pubic bodies. Um, but it's, this creates a looseness. And this uh, also creates the potential for uh, avulsion for the uh, muscles with the fiber cartilage cover to pull right off. And we'll show you a couple of examples of that. A diagrammatic uh, representation of the same thing. Uh, again, the injury, you get this uh, uh, tug of war, you get this enlargement um, of the space between the fiber cartilage cover and the bone itself. Uh, one of our famous um, uh, NFL players uh, who uh, was having uh, pain on one side throughout the entire season. And I'm going to show you some images that uh, may not be his entirely, um, but it uh, represents what, uh, what we often see. And so his pain, or often the person's pain, is on one side, and you see this looseness of that cover. Uh, maybe a little bit of going on the other side. And get, you try to get the person through the season with a steroid injection, not PRP. We'll get into that steroid injection. Um, and what ends up happening is you uh, end up with the other side through compensatory mechanism ripping right off. And you can see the darkness, the fiber cartilage cover came off in three, there's the three adductors I mentioned, they came off in three parts. You can see another one from the side right here. Um, and you can see how the, the injury extends up into the abdomen. And these are all very fixable. And it's a matter of understanding what the injury is, the anatomy, what you can do with the anatomy in terms of repair. You've got to mobilize, you've got to create slits and, uh, in the, in the uh, epimesium into the fascia and, uh, and then bring those, the muscle back up to where it's supposed to be. And um, uh, we, we're gonna be joined in a minute uh, by someone who had one of these injuries himself. This is, this is Justin Hardy, who's just coming in right here. Justin, uh, one of the real up and coming stars in the NFL. He plays for the New Orleans Saints. And, uh, this past Sunday, uh, I think it was against the Chicago Bears, wasn't it? Um, he uh, had this uh, um, injury, and, uh, and we'll, sh we'll show it to you uh, again here. Let's see if we go backwards here. Uh, had this type of an injury, and um, where he pulled things right off. And, uh, usually there's some type of a premonition in terms of, um, uh, you know, some type of uh, uh, looseness and pain. He didn't have that. What, what, what exactly did you explain? Tell us, can you tell us a little bit about what happened? Yeah, um, she was running down uh, on pretty much special team. And um, as I was running to tackle the guy, I had uh, grabbed him and I fell on the ground first and uh, felt the pop and I rolled him over. But uh, while I fell on the ground, I felt that pop. And I thought it was only like a, just a grade one or grade two groin strain. But after the MRI, 
um, feels a little bit worse than that. And when he came in, we came, he, fortunately he came in uh, two, yeah. two days later or the next yeah. day. Two days, yeah. And, um, and he was, uh, uh, how, how strong was your, how, how much could you lift your leg up at that time? How could you? Yeah, he's just profoundly weak. He just, you know, with that and with the dissociated hematoma and stuff, he just really couldn't lift it up, uh, lift it up, and and uh, and and we now we start people right away. We're getting the rehab part of it uh, already, but uh, uh, show us now your the leg that you got, and uh, maybe just show, can you lift? Can you lift? Can you straighten your leg out? And can you lift it up at all? Mm -hmm. It's fine. As far as yeah, other way. So I mean, he's better. He's better. And our aim is to get him back um, to playing. The, the Saints are in the playoffs, and we think we can get him back at the six-week uh, time frame. Uh, maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later. Um, but uh, uh, with the Saints, uh, the Saints really recognize these injuries early uh, when they won the Super Bowl a few years ago. Uh, we had a whole bunch of their players back. Uh, they had a bunch of those injuries, and they just uh, have learned to hop right on it. So in summary, what we're talking about here is you're, you've got uh, the core that speaks to the brain. The brain tells you how to shift, et cetera, the defensive back, how to guard against the, uh, what, you want, what you want to move to, to stop the pass. Um, and then the, the core tells the back muscles and the glutes and, and uh, all the innards uh, to what to do. And, uh, and then we get into uh, different muscles and I'll just go through this briefly and we'll have a pause and we'll go through the diagnostics stuff. Um, we have names for the various muscles and uh, the, one, the muscle that gets most abused is the beautiful muscle called the rectus abdominis muscle, which we call the Cinderella muscle. And uh, people tend to do way too many sit-ups and that causes all kinds of damage. And there's all kinds of um, injuries that occur the rectus abdominis muscle. Just uh, these are not hernias. Um, these you can see in this one up here that there's a, actually an injury down low and it created a big hematoma up higher. On this one, this is a patient with a hip problem and we were able to demonstrate all this edema. This is um, uh, the rectus abdominis muscle and the adductors fire like mad trying to protect your hip when you have impingement of the hip joint. And this can be mistaken as a real injury, but it's really a hip issue. Um, these other ones are problems uh, after hernia repair. People put in mesh, it causes an atrophy of the, of the muscle. You have all these staples around and it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't even take into consideration the anatomy. A um, whole bunch of other ones, uh, rectus abdominis muscle pulling off. Now, remember the upper end of the rectus abdominis muscle and the obliques work with, become the intercostal. So in certain sports, rowing and tennis, you get these subluxations of the ribs that become painful and uh, can take the athlete out of action. And, um, and I'll show you a, a short video in a little bit of how we fix that. And uh, that would be more in a rower. Uh, this is more uh, oblique. Uh, so this is, this is most likely a tennis player. And we actually remove a portion of the rib and do um, uh, a repair of the muscles below that. A diastasis, which, which really can be inhibitory when they start to pop out, athletes start to pop out hernias. Uh, this is a neurologic problem. This is a fellow, uh, is a surgeon who is cutting nerves for pain, and uh, and and we don't understand all the uh, neural anatomy, but this could cause a tremendous atrophy, and uh, that became a big problem as well. Now, another muscle muscle, muscle we call the Rodney Dangerfield uh, muscle, uh, and the um, uh, and the Rodney Dangerfield muscle. Uh, is um, uh, the, rectus, the rectus femoris muscle, uh, which really doesn't get respect, just like Rodney is, is one of our famous old comedians. And, um, uh, and there's an article from the NFL uh, saying that, uh, gee, if, they, if you rupture right there at the, uh, the rectus femoris up at the insertion site, you don't have to do anything about it. Baloney, this leads to other injuries in the core, to hip problems, you got to fix this. And it's a simple thing to fix. And uh, so we call that the Rodney Dangerfield muscle. This is, uh, uh, and, and by the way, I just had those pictures of the, the hernias, uh, hernia repairs, about uh, over 40% of our repairs now are redo repairs uh, based upon what somebody else is either treated like a hernia or using what's called a minimally invasive approach or minimal approach. 
because it's just a lack of understanding of anatomy. Uh, this, this psoas muscle we call the M&M &M muscle, M&M &M, the wrapper. Um, and you can see, uh, and the reason we call it the M&M &M muscle is uh, because you either love it or you hate the muscle, just like M&M, &M, but everybody agrees that it's important. And here is M&M &M, uh, pointing to the lesser trochanter insertion of the, of the muscle here. And, uh, and this is uh, what uh, he's pointing to in terms of the anatomy. The anatomy is really important and, um, and you can do various things to the psoas muscle. We figured out a way to restore uh, a lot of these people who have psoas muscles cut as part of hip arthroscopy and we can restore function. Uh, and, uh, uh, and not all people, but in a fair number of the folks. Um, and we also call this the M&M, &M, uh, or, or, or one of the other reasons we call it the M&M &M muscle is because it's, uh, his other nickname is Slim Shady. And he, it's, it's, it covers such a wide uh, area in the pelvis, the muscle does, that it can mimic a lot of the other injuries. So keep that in mind, keep the inflammation around the pubic bone, the osteitis, which is uh, secondary to all these injuries, um, to a lot of the injuries. Uh, as confounders, they can they can confuse you in terms of where their real injury is. And we won't we won't go into the deep derriere too much, but it's uh, this is an area which is still it is uh, it's, it, we figured out where the the muscles and a lot of the anatomy is, but we uh, we're not sure about how it works yet. And it's just ripe for research. You can get an endoscope in here, the sciatic nerve and piriformis, et cetera. And you know, it, it's not clear with some of these people at pain whether you should do some loosening of some of this tissue. We're not sure about that. Absolutely right for more research. So, um, uh, so we've got the core and the next step is we're gonna get into some diagnostics. Hopefully uh, your eyes are open uh, this time, a, a little bit more open in terms of understanding the anatomy. Um, and you know, it's sort of like, uh, uh, probably going too far here. But the, the um, Wizard of Oz, when, uh, when Dorothy sees uh, Technicolor for the first time, uh, hopefully that's the state you're in right now as we go forward. And then, should we take a break, Dinshaw, and, and you uh, 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 take some questions or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Dinshaw. So we've got some questions coming in, Bill. And uh, this is all regarding terminology. So uh, would you say a Gilmore's hernia is the same as a core muscle injury? Well, Gilmore really deserves a tremendous amount of credit because what he, uh, he you know, he avoided the term hernia. He called it Gilmore's groin. And you can absolutely love him from that, for that for, by eliminating the term hernia. Uh, but you can hate him for it because he named it after himself. And um, and, and his first article is, is Gilmore's groin. I mean, I have to give him a little bit of a dig because his first article came out uh, about a year or maybe six months after our first article. So I give I gave him a hard time about that. Uh, uh, and and he's a delightful person. And he really got it. The first the person who really got it the first the, the most I think is a guy named Nesovic from. Uh, Serbia from Yugoslavia, and uh, and he was writing. He never had a really anything that was really published that I saw in a, a in a real journal. He had an abstract uh, at the Olympic meetings back years ago, and he sort of turned myself and Bill Garrett onto it. And um, and it was it was uh, I mean he was he was getting it, and he had a little book that he read, wrote himself and with handwritten diagrams that he sent to me a number of years ago before he died. And I tried to visit him in, in Yugoslavia. It was right, it was during the Kosovo war and, the, and I couldn't get in. I, mean, I was in Kosovo, but I couldn't, couldn't or, or in Serbia, but I, but I couldn't get to his, um, get, get him to answer. Um, but uh, he sent it to me and it really, he had the same book as I have and it's, uh, but it's in, uh, in his own language and his own, uh, uh, he really uh, uh, got it. Really got it. These and, and so he was. Uh, he, it, the term hernia made him nauseated. Uh, sports hernia, just like it still makes every, all of us nauseated. I, I can see uh, the nausea in Alex's face right there. The second question that's there is, uh, Bill. What's the most common muscle 
that you're dealing with in uh, core muscle injuries? What's the most common uh, injury that you're seeing, number one? And what's the most common one that you are actually operating? Yeah, the, the um, uh, great question. And, and we see a lot of injuries. A lot, I mean, if, and I, I, I like to use little snapshots. Like I helped cover the Philadelphia Eagles, one of the NFL teams, uh, or have in the past, uh, often in the preseason. And, um, and I counted two years ago, I counted 14 adductor strains that occurred. And, um, and of the entire 14 people had this, they all got back to playing. And, and most of these injuries are mild. And if they're away from the insertion site, if they're away from that fiber cartilage area we're talking about, um, they get better for the most part without doing anything. When they're on the other end, at the femoral attachment end, they are um, likewise uh, something that you don't usually have to operate on. Occasionally, we've had a couple of people who they pulled it all the way off the distal end, we had to do something about it. Um, and so what we focus on is aspirating some of the fluid and then, uh, and then getting them back and often putting a little steroid in there and getting them back. So, so the most common, I think, muscles, group of muscles would be the adductor longus, the pectineus, and the brevis. Rectus abdominis is up there, rectus femoris in terms of quads is up there. And um, now having said all that, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. Hamstrings are number one uh, in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of the overall uh, strains and stuff that we see. And it's usually the same sort of thing. It's rare or not rare, but it's unusual. We have to actually repair the hamstring. Uh, those uh, get better on the moon too. So, so I was thinking more anteriorly, uh, but it, when you think of all the core muscles, those, those are the ones. And the ones you got to operate on, as I mentioned, are the insertional ones, the ones that really rip right off, the ones that, um, uh, that Justin had. It, uh, um, it, they, they can't play. And now there's different degrees of that. You get uh, more common than the, the real avulsion that, uh, that um, uh, Justin had is where it just slipped off a little bit and causes pain and they just can't perform. Uh, and kid, I don't know if you met the Dallas Cowboy Hunter who was here, uh, Chris Jones, and he was the He was, uh, he, he was um, uh, he's, I think he's just leaving today. He, he had a, uh, and he, he'd been dealing with the rectus abdominis injury all of last season. And he, and he called me up at the beginning of this season and said, uh, gee, um, I'm kicking myself because I didn't get it repaired. I didn't, uh, and, and I was talking to him and said, well, let's see if we can get you through the season. Well, he ended up, uh, so he couldn't punt because of his adductor. Um, now his last punt actually was against the Eagles and it helped us win the game uh, two weeks ago. Um, so it was a terrible punt and it helped us win the game. So, so as an Eagles fan, I had mixed feeling, um, but, uh, but he took himself out of the season and, and uh, we went ahead and repaired it. But the, um, the more common ones are ones that are just causing a pain and they can't perform. And we try to keep them going for a while. Alex? I just want to make one comment about this because I think this is something that confuses a lot of the people that take care of athletes where they say, okay, is this a rectus abdominis injury or is it an adductor injury? And I even have one professional soccer team, a butter trainer, who told me, I know how to handle adductor injuries, but I get really concerned when it involves the rectus abdominis. And I think that just implies a little bit of a lack of understanding of the anatomy because when it's an adductor muscle belly injury, yeah, that's that's the thing that's going to get better nine times out of ten. But when it involves that common attachment between the rectus abdominis and adductors, they may feel it in the rectus abdominis, or maybe they, they may feel it in the adductors predominantly. But that's the injury that's not going to get better most you know most commonly. That's the injury that needs surgery, and so it's really it's really that pubic plate attachment. And so to call that a rectus abdominis injury or an adductor injury is really just not understanding the anatomy. That's, that's a really good point. I mean, when you avulse the adductor muscles with a pubic plate with that baseball cover, um, it, the rectus abdominis muscle is involved because they, it inserts right on the other side and it's loose. And so you've got to realize that hey, it's more than just one muscle and the other adductors are involved too and you got to worry about the other side. The other thing where you get into, into arguments is somebody saying, oh, this is a muscle injury and the other person saying, this is a hip problem. This is FAI. Well, they occur together. And it's, it is a, is a, um, a spectrum in terms of 
Sometimes it's principally an, a, a, a hip problem. Sometimes it's prim, principally a muscle problem. And, and then it comes down to which one do you fix first? You do them at the same time. We do a lot of them together now, the hip muscle stuff. But, the, but a lot of people will do the muscle just to get them through a season and do the hip later on or something like that too. Wait, um, so let's get on to reaching a diagnosis. I think that's gonna be key for many of the uh, delegates here. So you get, a, you get a player, you get a patient who's get complaining of groin pain. How do you reach a diagnosis, both clinically and radiologically, as to what is his injury? Super. Can we get back to the slides? And uh, great. So um, I want to use the um, analogy of the, the uh, of the universe. That there's a really a universe of diagnoses, of course, in this core from nipples to knees, the mid thigh to mid chest, and you've got a, you know, you've got the GI system, the GU system, the GYN system. You've got a lot of nerves in there. There's neurological issues that occur. Um, you've got the musculoskeletal anatomy. Uh, you got the hip and the back, and, and the immune system is hugely in here. You've got real organs, and so you've really got to have a broad uh, uh, point of view uh, uh, perspective in terms of what these problems could be. Uh, but you're looking for the fixable ones. You're looking in the athlete, you're looking for things that. Uh... Thank you. Thank you oh, no for coming by. Anytime. Really. See you okay, see you Monday. Um, I guess J Justin was leaving. And um, so um, just so you've got this diagnosis, this question of how to diagnose these things. And, and you know, just to simplify it, we're talking about this, the stick diagram, uh, you know, what's in there, what's causing it. And, um, and, and you can get lost. It seems complex, but it's not. And, uh, you know, I want you to think about it this way. Um, and it gets back to the women, men differences. Um, and this slide put in there for me, just to remind me that we did a prospective study of women uh, in terms of what they came in with pain, what did they end up happen, having? And it, they split into three groups almost equally. Uh, it was, this is published in the, um, the uh, most prominent uh, uh, American sports, non-operative sports medicine journal. Um, it, they had hip problems, about a third of them had hip problems uh, alone, a third of them had muscle problems, and a third of them had, had other things, and uh, organ endometriosis, uh, gynecologic things, uh, other things, and there was tremendous overlap, not only between the muscles and the hips, but also the um, people with uh, endometriosis often would come in with groin problems and might have had a hip issue or muscle issue as well. And there was tremendous overlap. So think in terms of those three categories. Is it, is it hip? Is it muscle? Is it something else, something more serious? And, um, and on physical examination, you've got to do a complete examination and you can't do that in the locker room. You've got to recognize that, um, you know, while you can do certain simple things, you really need a more complete examination. So you've got to do it after the game or uh, or better the next day and with the, with the right chaperones, et cetera. And uh, of course, for most of the muscle tests, and remember that vector diagram in terms of the forces that are there, um, there's resistance tests for really just about every muscle uh, that you, and you can figure out uh, on a good clinical examination, what is hurting in them at that particular time. You also have to remember that the through uh, uh, com compensatory forces that that can change over time as well. But uh, the, so, so you, can, you can figure a lot of that out uh, in terms of what muscles are, seem to be involved. And then the second thing is uh, the, the, the hip uh, problems. Of course, you all know this uh, way, way uh, um, better than uh, certainly most um, other orthopedic surgeons and, and general surgeons, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, you know, the passive tests in terms of the hips are really important uh, to get a good idea in terms of whether it's a hip problem. Um, and then you go to diagnosis. The, with the good exam, of course, you're looking for other, other things too. And, um, and we, this is what uh, spurred us. When I was at Duke, we, we uh, did a, started doing MRIs primarily to rule out hip issues. 
Um, and we saw edema patterns, et cetera, but it was really when I came to Philly and with, uh, it was after um, uh, Donovan McNabb, one of our quarterbacks had a big injury that a Jefferson radiologist named Adam Zoga and then subsequently Johann Hannes Rodel uh, really got into it. And we've developed the MRI imaging to be able to see these things. This is a good example of an MRI that was done uh, around that time, which really didn't show much. It was with, done with conventional techniques. And this one is when we did, we try to reproduce exactly the same uh, picture uh, with the same settings and uh, just uh, changing a few things. And, and it just misses, the conventional MRI just misses a lot of the serious injuries. Um, and the MRI can really help in terms of the other problems too. This is a, a, a well-known college basketball player who had Crohn's disease. And, and when he was jumping, he would get pain in the pelvis. And this, what he had was a, um, a, a, a ilio vesicle fistula. He had a fistula between his small intestine and his bladder. And uh, that was causing his pain. And we ended up excising that doing a small bowel resection, et cetera. And, um, uh, but uh, also interposing some momentum with Crohn's disease, uh, you actually can, through laparoscopic techniques, put a piece, big piece of momentum down there and that can actually help the athlete uh, get through a season. Um, and that's sort of a fun, fun procedure to do because it's pretty simple and uh, with people with intractable Crohn's, which is uh, certainly, which certainly occurs in this group of patients, uh, that's a fun way to fix them. Um, this is a case of endometriosis of the, in a, 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 a well-known uh, long distance uh, a runner. Uh, she was in the Olympics and, um, and this, we ended up excising uh, that particular one. Um, with, uh, with a good radiology course, this is, you'll see funky things. And uh, this is actually a real bad psoas bursitis with masquerading as a tumor. Uh, we actually have seen a fair number of tumors in this area. Uh, I'll tell you a lot of specific uh, uh, stories about that. The femoral neck fracture is there and masquerade as, as different things. Uh, a chronic uh, paralabral cyst can cause some, um, some groin issues that you, that, uh, uh, and, and we've learned to uh, uh, basically uh, trephinate these cysts and uh, can, can take care of problems short term. Uh, this is a good example of a Philadelphia Flyer, one of our hockey players who had a quadratus femoris strain presenting as groin pain. Um, uh, he, it, he was thought to likely have to miss the playoffs and uh, we injected that and he got back within a couple of days. So when you think about treatment, think in terms of uh, non-operative temporizing, uh, operative, uh, and then other treatments if you find tumors, et cetera. And I thought I'd go into this a little bit, um, uh, but recognize there's a, a universe of diagnoses out there and you, and once you figure it out, uh, what the problem is, then you go into your mode of, do we do anything about it? Most of these problems, as I mentioned, the strains, et cetera, you don't do anything about it. at the insertion site. You better start thinking in terms of uh, whether you have to do something or not. Um, the, in terms of non-operative uh, steroid injections, they've been our mainstay or uh, just uh, anti-inflammatories, of course. But don't, as I mentioned before, don't use PRP. We're about to submit a paper to the Lancet uh, on this and um, just showing that there's a tremendously high incidence of heterotopic ossification. We've not found anybody yet who it really worked for the Long term and even the short term, it's hard to find, find uh, where PRP has worked. But the uh, and and when we did when we looked at our NFL players, uh, there it turned out there was a uh, almost eighty percent incidence of heterotopic ossification. The the success rate um, should be around ninety five percent in uh, six months to a year, and this is the control group here. And uh, when you have PRP. We had trouble getting them back in the even the short term in terms of three months uh, because they uh, had so much scarring, uh, even if they didn't have HO, and they, where they got uh, hematomas, et cetera. So we had some trouble in terms of getting them back. Um, and this is a good example of, uh, of uh, what we were seeing. Uh, the patient was left with the indentation, et cetera. Uh, we had a fair number of patients with indentations. This is, this is six months or so later. Um, this is heterotopic bone right here. This is what we removed. Uh, they weren't all that bad, um, but the but it's the the 
uh, incidence of this was really, really high. So, so be really be careful about PRP. We like PRP in many areas of the body, but we've learned uh, through uh, other uh, patients being treated elsewhere uh, about PRP issues. Um, if, if we could, I thought I'd just show you a little bit of, in terms of treatment. And um, I mentioned the rower's rib um, issue. Uh, this is like a 11 second clip uh, in terms of uh, rower's rib. And what we do is we uh, remove the rib and repair the muscle. But I thought this is a good, uh, we could demonstrate this in the clinic, but when the patient was asleep, just look at how we could flip. There's a subluxation of two lowermost ribs. And um, and you can just see this, is that, is that on? Is the movie going yep. right now? Um, as we flip through it, you can see how the rib uh, sort of flips back and forth. And this was a rower, uh, a really good rower. And uh, all we were through an incision right here, we excised this rib and repaired the muscle. Um, want to go into uh, really what Justin's injury uh, was. And um, we didn't do a, a movie on uh, Justin, but we did a movie on another lady um, the, um, who we saw, we did it the next day after Justin. And, um, and she had, she didn't come to see us uh, right away. She came three months after She's a really good water skier uh, and on the on the charts in terms of water skiing, in terms of the competition, and she um, uh, waited three months uh, uh, through advice, et cetera. She th was th thought to have a femoral head uh, uh, fracture. It was really a bruise, uh, but it was really a um, a real bruise of the femoral head. So she's on crutches, and she uh, because she was on crutches, she got um, really scarred in. And she basically had this injury, it'll be in the opposite side where we repair this. But th think of this as the principle in terms of what you're looking at, because you're gonna see a lot of scar in this, uh, in this uh, video, video clip. Now this is just Justin's injury. This is actually him from a, a few days ago. You can see the, the baseball, you see the fiber cartilage, the darkness, you see this chunk of fiber cartilage, which really represents the attachments of the pectineus, the adductor longus, and the adductor brevis. You see fluid here. And then you see the same chunk right here with just a, you know, a few millimeters of separation. And then you see how the rectus abdominis muscle is really divided as well. So his rectus abdominis muscle was off too. So you have to repair that at the same time. Same was true of this lady. It was a wider uh, gap and it had been, been uh, uh, present for a long time. And, and the I had the circulating nurse with her iPhone take the video. This is just from a few days ago as we get into this. And this is her. Uh, you can see how she, this is three months after the injury. Uh, the gap has actually gotten a little bit smaller because of some attempted healing. Uh, you can see how the, uh, this, this is the, her muscle mass, how it's atrophied compared to this side. Size, you see the fiber cartilage here. And when we get to this area, you can you also see how uh, this is, looks yucky. Uh, that's uh, an American uh, medical term. Uh, it's a, it was not very good tissue, this, uh, this fiber cartilage stump. So I actually ended up excising this whole area. And then we brought up the muscle mass up, up to here. And she had done the same thing as uh, Justin had. She had pulled off her rectus abdominis muscle and we brought that down. So when uh, most of the, probably the majority of the video, you're gonna see me uh, putting my finger in, uh, cutting through scar tissue, and really just trying to mobilize the muscle. The key to success is lack of uh, resistance, uh, uh, a, a lack of tension. And so you've got to, you have to go way down low and mobilize all this tissue down here and go way up high in the rest of the abdominal muscle to get that lack of tension. And, uh, and you have to do what it takes. If you, if you have to do more incisions, you do more incisions. And, uh, and then the, almost always there's enough fiber cartilage where you can sew fiber cartilage to fiber cartilage or muscle to fiber cartilage. And it, the fiber cartilage um, takes suture as well. Watch out for uh, uh, suture anchors. Uh, in the pubic bone, I've taken out many more than we've ever put in because they hurt and uh, it just, it's somehow the periosteum is just so full of nerves that it uh, causes pain. And those guys just don't get back to full play 
at least in our experience, but we've not put in that many. So maybe there's a there's a denominator out there which we don't know about. Um, and, and just uh, again, encouraging you all to get in this field, recognize it as, a, as a field. So let's go to the video. <clears throat> and what we've got going here is, um, is, is the video coming up? Is the video going? Okay, and um, is the pointer in here? Can you see? Can you see my pointer here? Yeah. Yes, but we can yeah. see your cursor there. Okay. Good, and this is the, the heads up here, your feet are here, and all this scar tissue, and you'll see as I'm putting into the, the last sutures, uh, and I'm using a, a non-absorbable suture here, how the rectus abdominis gets, abdominis gets pulled down to the fibrocartilage cover, There's, there was still some fibrocartilage in there, so I'm doing that. Now we're changing uh, views here. We're, we're going from the patient's top, which is over here, and her adductors are over here. And so the, we have these retractors in, uh, and this is, these are all adductors. And I'm, you're seeing me bluntly uh, and brutally going through a lot of the scar just to open things up. And then I'll, as I get down to where I think it's gonna be normal uh, adductor muscle, um, I'm gonna make a big cut into to this area. It'll, it'll be several millimeters thick, just getting through the, the, the covering the thickness. And when people go in there and look at the adductors after a big injury, they often think that it's normal, but it's not. You have to get through all that stuff. Now you can see the stump of the, uh, of the adductor longus. The, uh, the uh, brevis was actually part of that stump and the and tectineus was separate. Um, and I excised the stump and now I'm doing more mobilization. And I'm gonna take this uh, muscle here and bring it all the way up. And you're just gonna end up seeing some of the end sutures. This is well, that's the beginning suture, uh, but this is the end suture here where it's actually already up there, and it's underneath this flap here that we're doing the anastom the anastomosis. But we're pulling that up to the fiber cartilage. Um, uh, sorry on this particular thing, you can't see the actual uh, the complete repair. After the repair, I'm mobilizing more. Now that you brought it up, we're we're mobilizing that again just to get rid of all that uh, potential resistance. And then um, now I did that certainly with Justin, uh, but the anatomy was much more uh, evident. So if we can go to um, back to the slides and um, and get into a little bit into rehab and uh, prehab uh, prevention uh, again the, the universe analogy, universe of diagnosis, et cetera. And uh, we, we've got you know as a physical therapist or as a a sports performance expert, uh, one has to figure out what the goals are. Is it a re real high performing athlete? We're talking about the short term goals. We'll be talking about preserving his uh, entire career. Is it somebody who really doesn't uh, uh, participate that much in sports? And that's probably illustrated by uh, this, this slide here. Uh, David Rubenstein is the head of the Carlisle, Carlisle Group, the pri largest private equity group in the, in the country, maybe the world. And, um, and David made the statement that he was a great athlete until he was seven years old. And then he uh, retired from sports for a while. And, uh, and he, then he goes on to say that now he can uh, beat all of his friends who are ex-pro NHL hockey players because they all have new hips and knees and, um, and he, can, he can beat them in tennis. Um, it, you know, your goals in terms of uh, both uh, uh, performance and what you're trying to accomplish uh, as a physical therapist, et cetera, are going to depend. And it certainly depends upon um, in terms of what the rehab program is going to look like. And one of the state fears we have really is the there's a lot of physical therapists and athletic trainers, uh, et cetera, out there, at least in the United States, who claim they know how to take care of the core. They have these gadgets. I do a lot of sit-ups and uh, et cetera. Um, doing too many of those things that we talked about before is bad. Um, doing too much of any one exercise is bad. Um, so we're a little fearful about uh, where they go off to in terms of doing their rehab. And um, I thought I'd just turn to Alex a little bit and just ask him what uh, if he can just summarize some of the principles of the rehab that we focus on. 
Sure. So, I mean, I think one of the most important principles that we really find ourselves talking about a lot is just early activation. People, in, especially in the orthopedics world, tend to have a prolonged period of rest following surgical repair. And you just saw that reconstruction where the adipers were completely evolved. And, um, we can't hear you too well. Sorry, Alex, can you come a little towards the mic, please? I'm coming in, I'm coming in. Uh, sure. So, um, you know, we, we really rely heavily on early activation of these muscles. And so even in the case of a complete avulsion, like Justin had, he's doing um, full activation of his adipers the day after surgery. And that surprises a lot of physical therapists in this country and certainly uh, other practitioners. And I think the, the risk there is that if you let him rest for a week or two, like you would maybe after a rotator cuff repair, um, by the time he starts activating that muscle, things are really going to be scarred in. Because again, these are not tendons in the way that you traditionally think about them. There's a really rich blood supply. Things are healing very quickly. And you actually need to start activating them right away. And if you want to get them back quickly, that, that makes up a huge amount of ground in the initial post-operative period. One of the main principles also is just the rectus abdominis and adequate harness muscles are your central stability. And then all these lateral power muscles, you can also make up some ground in terms of stability by strengthening them. And so in people who are trying to play with an injury to the central apparatus, we do a lot of focus on strengthening the lateral structures to help offload that central structure. And so that also applies in the early stages of the rehab. For example, the glute med is something that a lot of even high-end athletes, there's room to improve on that muscle. And if you can just create stability with all the surrounding muscles while the central core is coming back online, that, that helps you get them back quicker and also avoids some of the, the limb deviation movements. If, if you cut those down, you're less likely to have setbacks during your recovery. So early activation, early rehab is really, really important. Uh, you want to do a lot, but not too much. And, um, and the, the second thing we do to prevent scar issues, scar, the recurrence rates are less than 1%, but scar tissue breakup is much more common. And the, the second thing we do is a gentle massage. And that's really, really important. Uh, but no active release massage too early on. As you can see on, the, on that last video, uh, I do a lot of mobilization, uh, we all do, of that muscle to, to the muscles so that you don't get uh, uh, much in the way of resistance and much in the way of tension. And if, they, if you get into active release too soon, you end up creating more bruising, more scarring, et cetera. So, uh, so we're a little bit worried about when we just let them off to somebody we don't know. Uh, we have certain rules about that, but uh, there really are some important principles. And uh, so let me just finish up and then we'll, we'll, we'll save some, a little bit of time for, uh, for questions. The, hopefully by now, um, you all, everybody has new eyes. There, there's, everybody is uh, seeing this in a totally different way. See that this is uh, uh, a real, real um, uh, important part of medicine and uh, I urge you to be thinking in terms of that whole unit, uh, the core as an organ. Uh, I used to think that the, uh, the liver was the, where the soul resided and the liver was the most important organ, of course. Um, now I've become uh, uh, more convinced that the, 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 the core uh, is the center of our body. And, uh, and, but don't forget the other organs of the athlete, the, uh, the brain, which uh, tells us how to use the core and the heart, which uh, often can work against us, but uh, can also get us the champion. Thank you for uh, allowing us the chance to, uh, to be uh, with you uh, today. Thank yes, you. yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a great honor from the side of the Indian Arthroscopy as being the secretary on behalf of the, all the 3,000 members. of. It's a really honor. We are grateful that you people have uh, been accepted. And I might my, my thank my good friend, Insha, for arranging this meeting. Thank you. Insha, we can go ahead with the questions. Okay. So, Bill... Do you think that all adductor tendon tears would be associated with a rectus tear? And if you're doing surgery, what percent of these, these would be combined? Uh, uh, do you always find rectus tears that you'd have to operate in the presence of an adductor tear that you're uh, fixing? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And um, I'm going to take one step back. And the area where we're calling the fiber cartilage, going back to anatomy, the area where we're calling the fibrocartilage plate, the pubic plate, the baseball cover, used to be, and still by many radiologists, is referred to as the common tendon. Um, and 
it uh, so what we've realized is that the if you look at the things uh, the, all this area with cross sections and uh, uh, microscopically, you have a lot of skeletal muscle going right into the fiber cartilage. Then you get these bands of fibrous tissue, and but it's still mostly muscle, and it's not like before that the fiber cartilage plate. There's a big tendinous structure, and like with the hamstring, it's not like it's all thick and and uh, mostly uh, fibrous tissue. Um, so we've we've learned to sort of discard in, in describing the techniques and stuff to sort of dis discard the term um, tendon because we're not quite sure when it really becomes a tendon. So what we do in terms of mobilization of the muscle is cut through some of that, that, that fibrous tissue. We, I call them fasciotomies and epimesiotomies because you get inside and just loosen up that tissue. And it, there's, you have to be careful about loosening it too much because then you lose it. And, um, and you can use some other adjacent adductors as buttress. Um, when, you're, when you pull off that fiber cartilage, that fiber cartilage plate, when you've actually pulled it off, um, the other side of it is the rectus abdominis muscle. And so that's really doesn't have an anchor anymore. So it's loose or potentially loose. And what you can do to repair that is uh, when you put your sutures in, you grab some of that fiber cartilage plate that your rectus abdominis muscle is attached to. Now, if you just take off, a, if, it, if it's just a small chunk of the fiber cartilage plate, it may not involve the rectus abdominis muscle. So you can just focus on that too. So, so it really comes down to, um, to um, that anatomy and the appreciation of how the three adductors move together. Uh, I just, uh, I wanted to introduce one person here who's become a wonderful member of our team who's a radiologist. And, uh, and as I mentioned, he, uh, Johannes Rodel, uh, he's uh, in blue there. He's, uh, he's got a, a a little bit of a German accent because he's from Germany. And, um, and he, I just wanna mention him, he, when we do a lot of our injections and we do a lot of differential injections in terms of the patient with pain, you're not sure where it's coming from, it'll, we'll inject, he'll inject almost anywhere in the body to, uh, with some local anesthetic and try to figure out, hey, where precisely is this pain coming from? Um, this is Johannes, I wanted him to say hello. Uh, Johannes, Hi. Hey, how are you? Yeah. How are you? Welcome. Welcome, Joan. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, as Dr. Meyer said, I mean, we, we do have very good MRI protocols, and you know, in most patients, we are um, able to identify the injury. But there's a, a certain subgroup of patients where we are not 100% sure that it is a core muscle injury. Um, as you know, the, the hip problems or hip pathology can present as bone pain, and this is a differential diagnosis. And we, we often do injections then where we, for example, have the patient um, aggravate upstairs. We have a, like a workout phase, a physical therapy phase with, um, you know, mats and, and um, you know, treadmills where patients can bring up the pain. So when they are sore, they come downstairs to, to see me and I do an injection with local anesthetic in the hip joint, for example, first. Then we send them back upstairs and they, they work out again. And we, we assess that the pain is better. If the pain is 100% gone, then we know it comes, you know, most likely from the hip joint if the pain is still there 100% and we bring them back down and we inject the, the core muscle areas and you know doing the adductors and the rex abdominis and then we send them back up and then they test it out again and we have um, you know some patients only if you have a golfer or a tennis player or, or a cricket player they only have pain with certain movements and we have a really a, a big workout play, um, area upstairs where they can really imitate their typical motion so we have a a golf simulator, for example, where the, the patient can, the athlete can um, practice and do a golf swing um, and thereby we reduce the pain. So we have a, a good setup um, to do those um, diagnostic injections. It's, uh, we were getting into more golfers uh, recently too. And the, uh, there's sort of an evolution, at least for me, an evolution of confidence in terms of this, in terms of where you think you're getting better. And every time I think I'm getting smarter, I get humbled in terms of the, uh, the injection the, into one area of the body gives the relief where I wasn't expecting it and the other one didn't. Um, uh, Alex I know, brought that up the other day. Any comments about that? I think like, for example, the psoas, that slim shape. Can you hear? Can you hear? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's really good at mimicking hip pathology. It's really good at causing lower abdominal pain. And so we'll often rely heavily on the honest to help us if we suspect a psoas injury or if we're having trouble ruling it out. 
that's often when you can unearth some of these tricky cell as involvements, which uh, oftentimes you have the suspicion, but really to nail it down, you have to, you know, alleviate the pain with that cell as injection. Okay, so we heard from Bill that you don't give PRP injections because of uh, heterotopic ossification. So your main injection is a steroid injection? Well, to get them through a season, yes. And, uh, and Alex has some good data on that in terms of our ability to get them through a season. Alex, yeah. Yeah, so we and just what would the sort of recurrence rates be? And uh, do you think that this is good for the short term, but bad for the long term? Do they come back with more severe injuries uh, in, in the future if you give them steroid injections? Great, great questions. Uh, well, yeah. I give, I give, uh, give Alex a good first joint chance here. Yes, so we, we're about 85% effective in getting people through a season. Um, typically, that's a NFL season, college you know, fall season, for example, like the college soccer season in, in America is very short, whereas um, the baseball season goes on for two thirds of the year. That may be wrong, Dr. Myers, will correct me. Um, so we, we took all professional and division one, which are our highest tier collegiate athletes, and we got 85% of them through the season. Uh, they did have progression of their injuries, and we do counsel our patients that they are likely to get worse. They're playing on an injured uh muscle group that they're going to rely heavily on. So all we're doing is doing what we can to decrease the inflammation to get them back to where they can perform at their level. Um, and so we did have uh, two of the patients progress to complete avulsions who had just a simple plate detachment. Uh, one was actually in the NHL playoffs and he still still plays despite that. I don't know how he did it, but um, you know, normally when that happens, people are done. And so we do counsel them. 15% of you aren't going to be able to make it through the season. And all of you are likely to have more severe injuries. But the one thing we did study was the post-surgical outcomes were no different than if we uh, stop and fix them mid-season. Yeah, we, we believe and we really take the attitude that these all these injuries at the insertion site are where, the, where you actually pulled some of that baseball off, the cover off the rest of the baseball, uh, progress. So, but it's a forgiving area in terms of the number of muscles and stuff that are there. So it's not like the Achilles where you're just going to rip it right off relatively predictably. Uh, these people, because of their other muscles that Eric can, can sometimes uh, do that. Now the, the NHL hockey player I men mentioned, this was, this he's a bubble player. And he, he if he didn't play that season, his career was gonna be lost. And, uh, and at least according to him. So he took that chance. He ended up uh, playing on it for a few months and uh, in total, cause it was going into the playoffs and then the, play, the team made it to just about the finals. And uh, and he ended up not getting the surgery for a while afterwards. And, and he ended up with heterotopic bone there too. No PRP, but heterotopic bone. And so um, so you get into that sort of thing. And that's true, I think, if anybody's going to put off an injury, try to play with it, it's the length of time that uh, that, that thing has been disrupted that uh, gets you into the heterotopic bone types of problems and we just see when you get that uh, just like with the hip um, there can be some long-term consequences to that. Can, can I make one other comment just going back to a question you had earlier about the, uh, the adductor tendon avulsions and I just Dr. Maraj maybe you could comment on this but some of the most devastating post-operative complications we've seen is when people do like a, a crack out stitch on that proximal adductor muscle um, which is appropriate for most other muscles with tendons, but I think it just highlights how you can't treat these like tendons. Dr. Myers, do you agree with that? Yeah, it's, um, it really comes down to what we talked about before and unfamiliarity with the anatomy. And, uh, and it's all teachable, but it takes um, a fellowship to, to teach all these things. And, it, uh, and it's a fun thing. And, and we would uh, you know, enjoy uh, having a, a fellow uh, from, uh, from your country if, there's, uh, if, if, if you'd like. And, and, uh, and you, you all, I think, are, uh, seem to be very eager to learn more about all this stuff and, and happy to participate in any, any way you can. Well, one more question. Uh, what are your indications for surgical repair in proximal rectus stairs? So do you operate on all proximal rectus avulsions? Uh, what if it's... Uh, uh, muscle tendon junction tear. Um, you're talking about rectus femoris, femoris. or rectus? Yeah. Rectus femoris. Yeah, rectus femoris, it really has to be up at the 
now that's a direct and indirect head accord. And the, most of the indirect heads, you don't have to do anything about. Um, uh, it's not totally true. We've had to aspirate and inject a fair, a fair number of those, and, but rarely have to repair those as, a, as an isolated thing. Um, but when the direct head has come all the way off right at the insertion site, I really think you have to repair that. Um, now, we don't have the control group. We don't, uh, now maybe, um, maybe there's a control group out there, but if you think of that one paper that was written uh, in the American Journal of Sports Medicine out of the NFL data bank, um, we went into each of those patients in, in, uh, in detail. And um, only one of those came back and he was what's called a long snapper. And, um, and he was, uh, which, which doesn't require that much in the way of uh, athleticism in general. And, and he lasted a couple of years. And, uh, but the other five, I think it was six, six or seven, the other, the other folks uh, had um, problems uh, that, uh, that continued. The proban, the person that led to that paper ended up having tremendous heterotopic ossification and needed hip surgery and muscle surgery um, after that. So, um, but anything more distally uh, is another story. You, uh, often you don't have to do something about it. And uh, uh, often if there's a, basically a compartment syndrome there, don't underestimate the power of doing a compartmental decompression, basically a fasciotomy in terms of, I uh, just did a uh, NBA basketball player who had hip surgery and had new range of motion of his hips. Uh, and the, it was incredibly how, how, incredible how tight the adductors and the, and the rectus femoris muscle was in terms of the thickening that built it up over, over years. And, uh, and so we did some decompressions. Hopefully it works. We, we, you know, this is only a few days old too, so we're not sure. Prof, uh, I've got a question. Go ahead. Yes, please. Yes. The thing is that when we read about the uh, muscle tendon origin and everything, like for the study of the athletic pubalgia, the, the, you, uh, all the people that, uh, tell that the rectus goes up to the inferior border of the pubis so that it goes like a J shaped incision. So, diagnosing the athletic pubalgia sometimes it overlaps with in the, even in the MRI. So, how you rely on the MRI? How, do you do something special to diagnose about the athletic pubalgia for the Rectus, or what's your take on that? Dinshaw, can you repeat the question a little bit? I, I had a little bit of trouble with your accent. I apologize uh, very much about that, but uh, can you, would you, would you mind? Oh, no, no. Quest, question is that, some, you know, question is that when we talk about or diagnose the athletic pubalgia with the MRI, because we know that the rectus goes up to the inferior border of the pubic, pubic, uh, pubis bone. So how, what's your best method of diagnostic tool for your athletic pubalgia to diagnose that, okay, it is the rectus is involved? So what we, uh, what Samantha is asking is your MRI signs for a rectus abdominis tear, are there any specific signs, both acute and chronic? So if they come to you chronic, how would you pick them up? Yeah, the... Um... Most of the people come because they're having pain and can't play. So we absolutely rely upon the clinical diagnosis over the imaging diagnosis. Um, we're, we're picking up more and more imaging uh, abnormalities that, uh, than before in patients who seem to be not having symptoms. So, um, and there was one study that was done, we did with the Duke team, Duke, the Duke soccer team, where we uh, and, and we, 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 we have been doing this with Manchester United over a period of time, where we are trying to do the whole team in terms of MRIs and see what their baseline is. And uh, when the Duke soccer team was interesting, we did pick up a few people uh, who had injuries that weren't symptomatic, and uh, one of which was symptomatic, and, and, and uh, that person, another person developed symptoms and ended up having surgery. Uh, but there are a couple of people who on that team who had some injuries where we, at least in the time that we knew the players, that never did any surgery. Um, does that does that get in close to what we're talking about in terms of the question? Uh, Johannes probably has some some important uh, thoughts about that in terms of uh, how often do we see this, and it's not symptomatic uh, in terms of imaging. Yeah. Yeah, I think I agree with Dr. Myers. And in general, like with any other injury, um, you can take imaging separately, you really have to correlate the, the physical exam is, you know, just as important or probably even slightly more important than the, 
than the MRI, but then the second one is a very good MRI. We need that, you know, really um, dedicated protocol that we have. And with the MRI, we have a fairly good idea. Injuries are acute or chronic based on the on the intensity of the of the signal of the T2 rate images. So something that is you know very bright is more acute than something that is more on the grayish on the gray side. And when the injury is more gray, then it's the side's more more chronic, filled with granulation tissue already. And then you know the third diagnostic workup, and as we talked before, uh, the diagnostic injections are also fairly important in, in some patients. So we that setup really physical exam, MRI, and diagnostic injections usually um, tells us um, you know both where the injury comes from um, and the MRI, especially if it's acute or chronic. A couple of quick points about that too. The, the we've learned that some of these injuries, even though you we, we think we've repaired them. Will, will persist in terms of the imaging, some of the imaging characteristics. And we've learned to figure out where there's healing tissue in there as opposed to no healing tissue. Uh, the second point is that the player with an imaging problem, a real uh, pro athlete with an, with an imaging diagnosis of uh, uh, injury is a little bit, a bit different in the off season than, than during the season. If the, even if they're asymptomatic, we might have a, an, a pro athlete who really needs to is looking forward to a long career, we might go ahead and repair it in the off season if, the, if there are minimal symptoms, uh, as opposed to most people where we would leave it alone and see how they do. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Thank you. Okay, okay so there's one more, and I think that will be the last question since we have reached the end. Uh, sight strains are really common in India in cricket fast bowlers. And we typically see this on their non-dominant side when they're doing the pull-down. Uh, side strains are also common in javelin. Uh, do you see a lot of side strains in the U.S. and how do you treat them? Now, when you are saying side strains, you're talking about in terms of tensor, tensor fascia lata and that sort of thing? or uh, The internal oblique coming off from the ribs. Okay. In, 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 um, internal oblique, yeah. Internal oblique. Yep. Yeah, the We see a lot of... We see them... Probably the number one position sport we see in them is, is baseball in terms of the, the batters. Uh, see a fair number in, in pitchers as well and, and other um, athletes. Uh, one of our, maybe our best catcher of all time had that. That's where he, that's where he retired from. And um, most of those, of course, as you know, do heal on their own, but it can be frustrating because it can take a long time. And um, now we do have a low threshold to inject them with steroid, et cetera, because we, it is a forgiving area in general. Um, but the, uh, the, we've learned that there are some sub uh, categories of those problems where there really is a rib issue, like we the subluxation problem that we talked about. Um, there really is a, a problem more down, downstream in the, um, near the iliac uh, uh, insertion where you actually have a partial evulsion there. Uh, there's, uh, when it's a real chronic thing in a golfer, we've had two golfers recently, um, PGA top level, top 10 golfers who had that problem. And we ended up, and it just persisted. And we uh, uh, went in there and, and functionally did, their obliques were just thick as can be and obviously chronic injury and overuse injury. And all we did was free up the muscle and, uh, and they did ter terrific. And uh, uh, actually on yours, Alex, did you, did you do any more than that? I don't know. Yeah, he, he had actually widened the linea semilinaris a little bit as well. So that medial attachment of the peak, which is something that I don't think about too often, but so did a little bit of reapproximation as well. Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's a, it's, it is a, it probably are some things we should be doing to get these people back quicker, but it's such a lingering issue on a lot of the folks. I'm, I'm just guessing it's the same same sort of problem. Great. Uh, any more questions, IPS, Sandeep? No, 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 no. Okay. We are, we are done. We are done. We are done. Thank you very much, Dr. Myers, uh, Alexander. That's been an eye-opener for us. Uh, core injuries are, are largely a neglected or ill-understood group of injuries, but they're really common in sports. Uh, we are identifying them uh, in many sports. And it's good to see that uh, uh, you know, we're getting more information on these injuries. We're also trying to decipher which are the ones that we need to treat non-operatively 
and which are the ones that do require surgery and surgery is going to get our sportsmen back to their sports a little faster. So thank you for opening our eyes. It's been a very enjoyable evening for us here on Saturday uh, in uh, India. Uh, IPS, over to you. Thank you very much. I mean, it was an amazing uh, discussion and a very frank talk right from your heart. I mean, this probably seems like a topic which is very, very close to uh, your heart. And you actually spoke emotionally and you actually presented in a way which was totally different format. Unlike a lecture, it was more like a uh, two-way talk and discussion. And uh, thank you for involving your entire team into this discussion mode. We really appreciate your uh, spending time with us. And Indian Arthroscopy Society is really happy that uh, they could learn uh, so much from you in uh, such a short time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And let, let's, let's finish with uh, Chris uh, Wilmot going on the screen. Chris, uh -huh. Chris is uh, very, very uh, infamous in this country. You know, he's been... He, he's, <laughs> infamous. He, yeah, he, he, he helps he helps uh, the communication. Like and, and Chris, uh, I, I didn't show knows this, but Chris was the number one schoolboy soccer player, high school soccer player out of out of England, and uh, he had a choice of playing for Chelsea or going to Harvard, and he chose the dark side. He went to Harvard. <laughs> and, um, but he was the reason why I had, had uh, set some records in terms of uh, a goalie and, and a shutout. Uh -huh. and, um, and Chris was actually the very first draft pick of the very first professional draft of the North uh -huh. American Soccer League in the United States. So, uh, and then he became an international banker and made a lot of money. So, uh, uh, is, is he still yeah, coaching definitely. coaching kids still? Is he coaching is some? Um, I did. Not, not anymore. Not anymore. Not I'm, anymore. Too, okay. I'm too competitive for this world. <laughs> you can't coach. The, the parents don't like me because I always okay. play the best players and I don't bring what I call the scrubs on. So they uh -huh. don't like me. Uh, <laughs> Great. Good to see you, Chris. Thank okay, you. Very nice to meet you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. you to all the Vincera guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a tea. Bye now. Thank you. Friends, so that was a wonderful webinar on core injuries. I think you would have appreciated the uh, this new topic and probably it has opened our eyes. Uh, we are joining in tomorrow with a collaborative webinar between the uh, Arthroscopy Society of Nepal, uh, the Arthroscopy Society of Nagpur, and the Indian Arthroscopy Society as as a collaborating partner. And uh, this is uh, in series of the rotator cuff uh, webinar. This is the advanced one, which we are doing tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, do join in on Sunday at 2 p.m. Uh, for a very nice advanced rotator cuff issues 